Good morning. I just sent a request to you and Far West. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, hello. Uh, hello. How are you? I'm well. How are you all? Pretty good. Pretty good. I know. I know. Paul is is um, here somewhere. <laughs> He's somewhere. He was just in his yard. Uh, doing a video about doing it. So I'm sure he's in somewhere. <laughs> so how you all doing? Good. D doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. How are things? We're going to kill a little time until Paul comes on. So how are things going? Well, uh, busy. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what's up, Paul? We, we're waiting on you to jump in. Oh, wait, let me send him a, um, an invite. So he should be in a couple of Hey, there we go. What's up, my brother? Hello. How are you all? I'm good. How are you guys all doing? Pretty good. So let, let's start with Far West. Introduce yourself. Tell us where you are, what you do. we we'll just go around the, go around the, the screen. All right, I'm Jennifer with Far West Forest Products, and we have an urban and salvaged and reclaimed wood business here in California. And I'm not in my uh, I'm not in my shop today. I'm in my home office. So, <laughs> but it is seven o'clock in the morning. So, and I have another <laughs> meeting. I have another meeting closer to my house, so it wasn't wasn't possible to go there and get back. So here I am. All so. good. Thank you. Matt. I'm Matt Cremona. I am in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. I do uh, urban lumber and fine woodworking and make uh, videos about all that stuff. And we love watching them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the That's the important. Home. Yes. <laughs> Paul? Uh, I'm Paul, Canadian Woodworks Legacy Lumber in uh, Ontario, Canada, just outside Toronto. And I'm a wood butcher, all the way from the log <laughs> to the uh, finished piece of furniture. <laughs> um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, you all have had previous conversations. And what I'm doing is taking the alumni and getting together in a forum and talk about the industry. So as always, it's informal. Um, I know Matt needs to go at about 45 minutes after. So maybe we'll check in with him first. Maybe he wants to give us a little tour. Tell us about <laughs> the difference between um, a garage shop and a real shop. Um, <laughs> and and uh, what that's like. Because all of us start, the, getting, the, getting the shop shop is what you do after the garage is too small or you've, or you've outgrown it. And that's something that, that everyone wishes to do is, is to outgrow working in, in uh, um, your garage. I mean, you have a home and a whole uh, compound now, but, right. uh, <laughs> but, but uh, can you talk to us about that, please? How, how are things going? Well, I'm still in a garage, so. Yeah, but you're, it's, you're in a garage on 22 acres. <laughs> it's it's still a garage i can go outside and spread out if it's not raining i guess uh and so i i went from a two-car garage to a 
larger three car garage. So I had 400 square feet at my old house for the shop. And now I have 650 square feet in this garage. But one of the things that has kind of evolved for me is that now we're on this property, it has more uh, like external storage areas. So we have a larger shed and we have a barn that I can store things in. So I'm kind of transitioning more towards a more efficient workspace because I don't keep things in the shop that I don't use constantly. And I have machinery now that I can move the woodworking equipment in and out of the shop if I don't need them. So the biggest thing that I moved out of my shop is my lathe because I don't use it very often, but I still need to have it every now and then if I want to turn something. So for the one time a year I use my lathe, I just take my skids through up to the barn, pick up my lathe, then drop in the shop. And that saves me all the space in my shop. But I have more breathing room. I'm, I'm really starting to see the value of having just more just like open space to walk around. Instead of trying to cram every single little thing into your shop that you possibly ever want, having less stuff actually is far more efficient and better. It's so much more productive. Yeah, we, we spoke about that last week, and, and I'm guilty of that horribly. My shop is packed, <laughs> and we were outside working on stuff in the street. There you go. So, so having, <laughs> having stuff, having room to work inside is, is, is a plus. But also, I saw you had a building you were working out of. Uh, I have a warehouse as well, yeah. A warehouse? <laughs> it's a warehouse, Matt. Is this going to be slabs for sale, finished products for sale? What, what's going in there? So the, the warehouse, I've had that for about a year now. Actually, I, like exactly a year now. Uh, that is where all of my like physical product business kind of lives out of. So I, I try to keep the, the home as like the content business side of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the physical product lives at the warehouse. So that's uh, any uh, slabs, uh, my workbench kits, and my chair kits are all there at the warehouse. And I have, I'm, I'm trying to start moving my own lumber there as well because it's a lot easier to just put my stuff up on, up on a pallet rack. And when I want to select lumber for a project, I just pull the whole rack down. I have 2,500 square feet there. I can just lay all my boards out inside, especially like in the middle of winter. Like it's not fun to do that here. So <laughs> inside <laughs> in a heated space, I can like, I can peruse my lumber and pick what I want to use for my project. It's a lot more convenient to do that there than uh, here. Cause I would do that in the driveway in the snow. Normally. California girl just got cold. So <laughs> <laughs> it gets cold here. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so Matt, what, what's your vision for your current property? What, what's the big picture? Uh, so the, I guess the bigger long-term picture is to establish a, like a business zone in the back of the property, which is where I would put, uh, my own, my own shop and then the, the sawmill operation as well. To kind of get that away from the house a little more. Okay. All right. So that, and that would just need to be rezoned. I just built mostly. Okay. All right. <laughs> Country life. Country life. <laughs> yeah, I just got to get around to doing it. But I'm not really in a rush, so it's all right. Okay. Um, so, far with a couple of things I want to talk, uh, questions I had was you are in on the, the essence of what we do and with organizations and how we can make this stuff more profitable or certified so we can become a part of the building infrastructure. Yeah, so, so I'm, uh, in addition to operating Farm West Forest products in Woodmiser, California, I'm also a director for a nonprofit, the Urban Wood Network uh, for the Western region. So everything west of the Rockies Urban Wood Network comes through a, a nonprofit here that that's, it's called Urban Salvage and Reclaimed Woods, Inc doing business as the Urban Wood Network. And so we started several years ago, we were, we were looking at the enormous amount of trees that are coming out of our cities and they're going into the landfill. We've got landfill issues, we've got um, waste stream issues. And all the while we're importing all these exotics and our urban woods will rival them any day of the week. And so, we were, I informally for the last 20 years, been networking with Cal Fire and, and large tree services and sawmill owners and woodworkers and all these pieces put together. 
And finally, in 2016, 17, we actually formed a network to do something about it. And so my idea was, boy, we pull all these resources together. Uh, everybody's producing just a little bit. You're still a small uh, private owned business getting to do your thing. But how do they sell it? How do they really get it to that next level? And so one of the thoughts were, oh, well, we'll go talk to these mid-sized uh, lumber stores. Uh, we'll go talk to architects and designers, and we'll aggregate our inventory together and get it in there. And great idea. They loved it. We talked about the carbon storage that was, you know, the carbon's now stored in these flats. It's stored in these, this lumber. And, you know, the great benefit to the environment and they're like, oh, man, Jennifer, that's a great idea. We love it. But this one time I got some urban wood, and the guy said it was dry, but, you know, it moved on me, and, it, you know, then these bugs started crawling out of it. <laughs> and then, you know, there's all these uh, rural thefts here in California. So they're, they're like, well, how do we know that it actually that, that you actually own this, you know? And, and how, do, how do we know where's your chain of custody? Where's your certification? Where's your standardization? So I went back to the drawing board and said, okay, we need to write standards for the urban wood industry. And these standards, you know, some people, you know, you build a relationship. I know, Matt, you've got some great relationships with customers. They don't care if you have a certification or a standard because they trust Matt. <laughs> um, but when you're trying to get into, uh, when, when you're trying to get into uh, some of these larger locations that really move, a significant amount, just really move that needle on the amount of woods that are going into our waste stream, then we have to deal with people we may not have time to build those great relationships and that trust with. And so for those, we need to have some standardization so that if somebody wants to come in and buy a, a unit of four-quarter ash lumber, if they get it in California, if they get it in Milwaukee, if they get it in New York, they're getting a certain grade. And so but we all know that urban wood has really weird grades. It, it's, it's different. It's, you know, it's grown different. The growth rings are different. We accept things that others would consider defect, and we call them beauty or, you know, it's part of the character. It's part of the allure. And so, um, and so we created urban wood grades. Uh, we uh, we created standards and chain of custody so that, so that those woods can be certified. And the purpose, and, and then we created an easy pathway to actually do that, especially if you're a city, you know, if it's coming through a city, uh, you, you track the distance that it traveled, so that has a carbon footprint associated with it, and then you're able to say, boy, this has stayed within a, you know, a hundred mile radius of where the tree grew to the building that it went into, and those are really great for lead certifications, it's great for, you know, just a lot of different things with that, so... Having said that, those standards went out for their final draft out to a group of stakeholders who are interested in taking theirs to the next level. And we are hoping to vote them in to a actual usable product on August 25th. So super excited. Wow, that's really cool. Wow. So that's really cool. us yeah. being far from you, how do we get in on this? Well, first thing I would recommend is join the Urban Wood Network <laughs> wherever you are. Um, and, and I don't think most of you are in the Western region. Paul, I'm not sure. But where are you located? Ontario, you Canada. Okay. East. I'm sorry? East. East, East. Yeah. yeah. But, East, but yeah. either way, the Urban Wood Network is, is nationwide. I'm, I'm on the steering committee for the National Urban Wood Network as well. So you just apply. Um, we, right now we have two websites. We're coming together into one website so that we can really just be a, a united voice for urban wood, for the urban wood movement uh, nationwide, just helping, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a call from somebody, hey, we're having trouble getting our city to communicate with us. So we provide case studies of, hey, here's, you know, here's what the city of Milwaukee was able to do. And, and Milwaukee city trees go to this sawmill and then they're then they're sold you know then then they're there's a broker in between a consultant woodward forest products and then they take that wood and they sell it and put it to its highest and best use and so we're, we're able to just show those case studies so that so that other cities can get involved and just helping in other ways we help market oh shoot we lost paul he'll, he'll pop back in i'm sure <laughs> um, yeah so so when are you going to join? 
Yeah, you know, we talked about this before. When are you going to join the Urban Wood Network? <laughs> I want to do it now. That, that's why I keep, I keep asking because we need to make sure that. Where's Paul? We need to make sure. Paul, you need to um, request again. Mm -hmm. I, have we, not, we, I have not joined yet, but I need to. You do. We need, we need Advocate New York. We're starting to develop chapters as well, in uh, trying to develop a chapter in each state, so that, so that uh, we're, so that there's feet on the ground, just kind of a, a local network to partner with. And hey, I can't use this tree, but I don't want to see it go to waste, or you know, and, and just partnering in those types of ways. But marketing is huge too, and you know, we do a lot of marketing to help our our network members. Well, we're also. And it's also possible revenue because you get leads on, on docs. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I said it's also possible revenue because you get leads on jobs. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we have a directory and, and we do a lot of marketing. State of California, Cal Fire funds a lot of what we do. And so we're able to take those marketing dollars and just put them right back into the businesses that, that are, are you know, doing the work of rescuing the urban trees. And it's urbanwoodnetwork.org? Uh, urbanwoodnetwork.org, yeah. And then on the West Coast, it's it's uh, urbanwoodnetworkwest.com. But we are working with a, uh, in, in the next two months, those two are going to merge into one. So you got the interactive map on one, you've got other stuff on the other, but we just did a survey and everybody said we want one common voice. So so we are merging the website into one and we're gonna have that one common voice for the people. Great. And what's going on with um, Far West? How, how are you all doing? We have had the craziest year ever. Uh, I, I felt so, I mean, I, I, who, who hasn't, right? But, but uh, we have had the busiest year ever. Every, I, I mean, it's, it, it's a pandemic and you, you just expected all these, you know, you, you know, there's all these people out there not working and, you know, and, you know, just really struggling in certain, in certain trades. And you almost feel guilty because we have not had that issue. We've had the exact opposite never seen higher sales uh wood miser we, we also sell wood miser wood miser we're at a year and a half on on a hydraulic mill right now and, and it's i mean we have never sold so many mills and in i've been doing this 20 you know with wood miser 20 21 years so so it's it's been insane and, and the wood sales right along with it and and the lumber prices this summer was interesting with with the skyrocketing of of traditional uh, lumber this last summer, we we saw a lot of people who didn't look twice at Urban Wood before finally going, so what's this Urban Wood stuff? You guys have changed your prices, so sh show me what you got. And, and so that, uh, we, we were able to open some doors that weren't open to us before because we didn't, you know, we weren't going to price gouge. Uh, we we kept we were able to stay consistent. Um, you know, if, if labor changes, maybe we have to raise it. Fuel, we might we might see eventually some slight increases. But so far, it's just been we've just been able to hold and, and do what we do. So it's been great. So, okay, so with the with the Urban Wood Network, there's a price set at what the wood should be, what you should be charging for the wood. No, there, there's. Uh, er, each region is going to be a little bit different. So pricing is not something that, that we have done. Although another thing that I do is we're building an app um, that is an e-commerce solution. It's called the Urban Lumber Market. And so you'll be able to put your product in there. It's going to track that chain of custody. It's going to track what your certification level is, how many miles it's traveled, how much carbon was stored in each piece or unit of lumber. Or, or slab and and the board footage, et cetera. And then it's gonna push that product up to an aggregated marketplace, real similar to like an Amazon shopping experience. And, and um, so if somebody goes into this and they go, oh, I like that, oh, Max, you know, here's this, I want this, I want this in this cart. And you can literally buy from five different, you know, it's, say they're doing a big white oak floor in a new, you know, Starbucks chain or something. And um, 
and one one user doesn't have enough, but if they pull five different units from five different uh, five different uh, uh, persons who have product on there, they have that customer has one shopping cart, but is getting from multiple aggregated uh, sources. So. How how long before that launches? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> We, we we are testing we are testing the inventory and chain of custody now and we think we've got it nailed. Um, so that part of that part of it is there. The e-commerce part, uh, the the build out on that is not complete yet. But we're hoping we're hoping that the e-commerce side of it is out by October. That that's our hope. But, but you we're, not gonna, we're not going to promise that. So. If you need three additional people to test it from different parts of the country. I, I we would. Great. You want to be a beta tester? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I know Paul would. <laughs> yeah. So Paul, how you doing? Doing good. You move a lot of, I'm going to move a lot of wood. So her conversation will benefit you greatly. Yeah, it's kind of uh, definitely. We since I last spoke with you, Robert, we had a major change in that we have our own uh, kind of dealer network. So it would probably like where I don't necessarily sell to the retail public anymore. Um, we have dealers all the way from British Columbia to New Brunswick down to Boston and even California. we got one guy in Los Angeles. Um, so probably for my dealers, I think uh, uh, it would make sense. Yeah, definitely. And it, congrats to you, Far West. Like that's a lot of work. Like to, that's uh, sounds like a lot of paperwork. <laughs> But uh, I love what I'm hearing, like, um, for sure, with the urban lumber, like, that's what I specialize in, too. And, and uh, I get asked a lot to to import exotics from other countries. And I'm like, I have an entire field of maple trees and oak right. trees and walnut. Tre like, it's all here and it's all beautiful. It's all usable. And uh, and, and honestly, the, the market for me anyways, and the people buying my lumber, they want the local stuff. And they they do. Yeah, yeah, they understand uh, the carbon capture like you're talking about there. Uh, you know, you're not shipping the stuff from, from wherever you're. The chain of command, too, like, is it getting cut down properly in another country? So, uh, um, mm -hmm. fortunately, I guess with the urban lumber, you're almost getting, you know, a certification already around me because it's already, it, it, it's not like California where I guess, like, there's people hunting burls in, in forests and stuff <laughs> yeah. where, where it's like basically all the trees here are getting cut down from actually, you know, old age and, and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's going good. Going good, Robert. You can't complain. So how many dealers do you have? Oh, oh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, 12, <laughs> 12 around you, there somewhere. And you supply them all? We supply them all. Yeah. We got a small little team here. Uh, I've been wow. fortunate to invest back into my business along the way. So, you know, uh, large machinery, basically, um, we're able to process it. Not only that, we, you know, 95% of the lumber that leaves here is already dressed flat also. So we have a few uh, machinery that really helps with that. Um, and keeping up our bottleneck now is drying kiln capacity. Always. <laughs> oh, yeah, always. Exactly. So we do outsource some kiln drying uh, to a local place. Uh, we have our own vacuum kiln, which works really well for the larger uh, thicker stuff and then we have a conventional kiln and we plan to add another conventional kiln and another vacuum kiln very shortly wow <laughs> not only that i'm actually developing the vacuum kiln myself <laughs> very cool yeah yeah pretty excited to uh, to get that on with yeah so, so what what's your in uh, sorry is it okay if i ask a question <laughs> what, what, what is your end product like what um what what are you selling them units of lumber, slabs of lumber, or are you consigning it to these dealers? Like, how does how, do, how does that work? Um, we actually very very start started with a consignment uh, model, but we now switch to a we basically have like a, a suggested MSRP basically, and then the yeah. dealers will get uh, you know a certain discount off of that price. They can obviously sell for for whatever they would like, uh, but me, fortunately. You know, myself being a woodworker and buying lumber and being involved now, I don't know, 12 years or so, uh, I'm, I understand the pricing. So I kind of also know like what the fair price is kind of thing. So we, yeah. we suggest the price and we give a large discount off of that. Um, and it's pretty crazy how much one inch thick walnut we sell 
from eight inch wide to 14 inch wide for charcuterie boards, I guess, cheese boards, right? Yeah. Um, every single order for that goes out to our dealers has 300 to 500 board feet of five quarter. Um, and then obviously like book matchable slabs, as you know, two slabs to me. Our trees are not as large as uh, as our friends in California, so uh, almost our, almost so yeah, most of our yeah, truck, pops, truck around the center of it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm blown away by uh, the, the windfall in uh, redwoods that you guys cut up and stuff like that. Like, oh my god! But uh, yeah, book matchable slabs, so eight quarter, nine quarter slabs, and of course we do get large trees, so the single slab tabletops. So. Yeah, virtually all live edge lumber is what we're selling. Um, and all generally, kill, you know, we sawmill it, we dry it, and we also surface it flat for our dealers. Um, it's also been very good that almost all of our dealers are already woodworkers also. Um, and they have a following on social media, you know, YouTube or Instagram, something like that. And uh, they're able to very easily tie into selling lumber into their, into their already ongoing business. And not only generate revenue from selling the lumber, but really expand their woodworking business because now all of a sudden their customers are walking into their building and, and they have a couple thousand board feet of lumber where a lot of these guys used to be like meet with the customer and say, oh, yeah, I'll have to find you the piece of wood. I think, so yeah. uh, I, I feel good that I'm really helping grow their businesses, not only, you know, selling my lumber and making making a revenue stream that way, but uh yeah, helping grow their business that way. It, it's, it's feels it's good. It's a cool feeling. Yeah. Super yeah. Cool. I, the, the model, so we're doing kind of an opposite model up here uh, with, with the Urban Wood Network and, and USRW. We applied for a grant because a lot of the sawyers don't have, all they want to do is saw. They they don't want to deal with the public. They don't want to do retail. But, you know, I, I just want to saw. I want to dry my wood. I'm good at that. And and um, so they're still producing a decent amount of wood, but they're producing exactly how much they want to produce on their terms, you know, small owner operators. And so we received a grant from the state of California, uh, uh, USRW, the, the nonprofit did, the Urban Wood Network, um, and so Far West is going to uh, manage the, this facility, and we're going to open a facility that allows different people producing urban wood in the area who don't want to have retail, who don't want to do that, to bring their wood into the store and to be able to, uh, our, our, our location or our staff will manage the sale of that. And then uh, they'll get they'll get paid what it sells, and so we're still working out the exact business model on that. But we have a location, and we are we are uh, we we better get busy. I have a lot of work to do. So. <laughs> That's that sounds like a great idea, though. You're basically letting the sawmill operator, the kiln operator, do what they do best: get lost, exactly. saw yep. into great lumber, and then yep. basically you're then bringing eyes to their products. Basically, exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 That sounds like a great idea. Yeah, so it, it kind of give uh, kind of even the playing field for for them getting their product sold as well when they may not have as large of, of a uh, you know customer base or visibility on social media. Maybe they don't have the time to post on social media as often, and so it, it just kind of equals that equals that out and, and helps them, and and we sell more urban wood. So, um, Matt, yes, how, how much wood do you sell? Not in kits, just in raw lumber. Is it, do, do you try to sell a lot of slabs or just when someone calls? Um, so lumber sales, so when I first, like a long time ago, my side hustle was selling lumber out of my shed at my old house. So I, I know the experience of retail lumber sales and it's not something I have time for at this stage in my life. So I don't really, lumber sales is not really a focus of my business. I don't, I don't really focus on it much. If someone comes in and they know exactly what slab they want to buy from the video I made, then I will sell them that slab whenever I have time to have it dried or pull it from the stack or whatever. But it converts the sales process to be more on my time or the desire to pull that slab out and get it dried. That's when they'll get their lumber. So it's more, much more of a long-term sales funnel for that person. But I'm able to sell whatever I need to to keep stuff out of here so I can keep cutting more stuff. 
Sounds kind of like a gravy train. It's it's kind of like that, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, do do you plan to hire um, anyone else, or are you just going to keep working your wife and your kids together? He's so, going to keep bringing those kids. Yeah, yeah, well, they're they're going to be working for free pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my first hire will likely just be someone on the production side or the uh, the video production side because that's the focus of the business. And that's where I need the most help. Okay. That's where I spend the most time now is sitting at my desk. Ooh. Editing videos. Right. Editing videos, writing the articles for them, and then actually posting them. That takes a significant amount of time. Okay. Um, for me, I spoke about this last we, I moved shop, moved yards from one place to another, and it was absolutely exhausting. Um, I don't know how you did that. I, I watched it looks terrible. That, yeah, it was. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I started, I was there for eight years, and we would get wood every day, and you're thinking, oh, I'll take that. Oh, I'll take that. Oh, I'll take that. And you just pile it up. <laughs> and then when you have to move it, you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Why do I keep that? <laughs> <laughs> Did I really need that? So that, 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 was, that was an exhausting and expensive. And now that I'm in a new place, um, organizing it is, is, is a problem as well. Because when the trucks delivered, I was paying for them. So the, the dispatcher explained to me, she's like, you need to take everything off the truck, sit it on the ground, and let the truck go, and organize it on your own time. Well. If trucks are coming two a day every day. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Exactly. So after everything was all over the ground, I had to spend another four or five months putting them in piles, and I'm still not done with that yet. But it was <laughs> it was it was very expensive to to move it. So like six fifty a truck, and there was forty five trucks. And yeah, so how, so how many board feet? Mm -hmm. uh, close to a million. So how, uh, what's your, how do you sell your lumber? I, 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 need, I need to be more like you and less like me. <laughs> well, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> right, right now, I'm in between you and Matt. <laughs> you, you push it, push it, push it. He's like, ah. So <laughs> I, I, I sell it by board foot. I sell it by slab based on the dimensions. But I, I try to, I'm always looking for the biggest and the longest log I can get because that makes native lumber rare. So I try to turn something that's very common into something that's not common. So that's how I wind up with 15, 25 foot boards, et cetera. And I air dry it until it's sold. And at that time, I put it in the kiln if I have a long it needs, and it comes out, and it's gone. But I'm not like you, Paul, who are moving a lot of units. And now that I'm in the space that I am, I need to change the business model because it's too much to handle. Right. It's, 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 it's just too much. So I need to get a, 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 a stream to start getting stuff out and getting more stuff in. If only there was some sort of uh, urban wood network. <laughs> right? 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 I got a That's question for Far West. West. <laughs> Far West, how, how long has your business been around? Uh, 1983 is the is the year that we started Far West Forest Products, but it wasn't until the late '90s that, when I took over the marketing, that I realized, hey, what we're what we're doing is urban salvaged and reclaimed woods, and so that's when uh, I think I, somewhere late '90s, early 2000s is when we really just started to go, okay, this is our marketing thing. Yeah, this this is who we are. This is what defines us. And so, I, so we're, that's went, all, that we were already already urban, like that same model, like back then in the '80s. Wow. Uh, well, 
a, a little bit different, not, not, not completely. Um, it was, it, we were, we were moving urban wood, but we, you know, the term urban wood, who, who knew that? You know? mm, okay. we, we, were, we were doing it because we, you know, because it was economical and it made sense and it was beautiful wood and we didn't have the money to, you know, and so, you know, you, you do what you do. And, uh, you know, as a, as a kid, my dad was, would, um, he was a, a contract timber faller and that was his, you know, what he did in the summer. And then uh, in the in the winter, when you know when the woods got shut down, he would would see these trees and he go, "Why are you going to waste that? That's beautiful." You know, a tree fell in somebody's yard or you know about to fall on somebody's house, and so that you know he would knock on their door and say, "Hey, I can help you with that." And then he oh, you know cool. he'd sell it and 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 kind of kind of go through that with an old chainsaw mill or you know hack it up. However, and then, uh, in the nineties, we bought a wood miser. And uh, then, then we were really able to start bringing some of those uh, some of those urban trees in, and we had a packaged firewood business in there too. So, so it wasn't all urban wood through through the '80s, but that really became a focus. Probably mid uh, mid '90s became a real focus, and late '90s it was some ninety percent of everything how, that we. How old is your dad, and how is he doing? He is in his seventies, and he is doing fantastic. So he is still at it, and <laughs> out there you'll, you'll see him on those videos with that chainsaw. We'll go, Dad. Let let my my, my son works for us. I'm like, let Wyatt do that. Nope, he'll do it wrong. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> How's he gonna learn? Come on. <laughs> so, do we have any questions um, from all of our viewers? I'm sorry. From all the viewers, eh? I got another question from Far West. <laughs> sure. Obviously, we're all live on Instagram on social media right now. Again, I, I'm always, I've always been interested in uh, in picking the brains of businesses that are obviously established and been around for a while. So, what what type of marketing w were you doing back then? We were not doing an incredible amount of marketing back then. Uh, it was more word of mouth back then. Uh, I took over the marketing probably late late nineties, and I don't remember the year that Facebook came out, um, but it was a game changer. <laughs> so I mean, we had uh, be before that we had you know a website, nothing like websites are today. We had a website and a short little email list. Um, then when Facebook came out, it was like absolute game changer. And Instagram, even though we don't uh, uh, we don't have as many followers on the Facebook side, Facebook is still one of the major drivers to our business. Um, but Instagram is Instagram is gaining speed fast. In the in the last week, we've had three of those giant sequoia. The, you know, the really big, you know, 28 foot, 62 inch wide slabs. We'll have, you know, and, and so people come in to buy those or fly in usually. And, and they'll, well, I always ask, you know, how, how did you find us? Or, or our staff will ask that. And it's almost always Instagram now. And so Instagram is our big marketing, um, uh, face, uh, Facebook. I, I do, you know, our relationship with Woodmiser honestly gets us a lot of publicity that we might not have otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, and, you know, I travel and do trade shows with it, with, with that and, and do used to <laughs> back, back when we traveled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But, but, but so those, those are some of the marketing things that we do. And, and, um, and now with, with the store coming out, we finally, for the first time, um, have somebody, uh, dedicated part-time to that same job is you know it's not very much time but it's you know maybe five to ten hours a week of your job is to work on marketing strategy marketing plan because my bandwidth is getting uh, gets smaller <laughs> how about you myself it's um it's, I, I do actually have two businesses too. I have a, a furniture business, a fully finished furniture business, as well as the lumber business. And the furniture business is, it's funny. My wife and I, we talk, we literally sit on our hands until an email comes in that says, Hey, I've been following you on Instagram. I would love an eight foot table. I would love a, you know, a picture of this. Like I've mm -hmm. done zero paid 
marketing. Um, I, I was fortunate. I kind of hopped on the Instagram bandwagon pretty early in 2012. Um, and uh, w- having that awareness and people seeing what I'm doing is, has really driven my business. It's been, been fantastic, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, all social media with me. Like, we do nothing traditional or paid, really. Um, yeah. And I used to have a, bit, a different business where we had yellow pages and newspaper articles and this and that. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of money you had to spend to do all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. versus um, versus now. I guess it's a slightly different, though, Instagram. I, if you're starting out new, you got to probably, you know, boost boost stuff and, and pay a little bit more. I, I don't know. I'm, again, very fortunate to have a large following. I don't know why yeah. they're here, but they're here. <laughs> well, you have a for question. Awesome. Go ahead. Oh, um, I just said they're there for awesomeness. So. <laughs> yeah, that's the cool thing. Everything that, you know, all of us are doing, we're doing really cool kind of normal stuff to us every day. Yeah. But fortunately, what we do yields to cool pictures, cool videos. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And also, edu- you know, I'm always trying to, not necessarily trying to, but, you're always like educating too with everything that we're doing. And uh, I think that really resonates with, with all of our followers. Yeah. Yeah. The question is how can you help the sustainable future for hardwood forests? I, I think that we're already doing that by using urban lumber. The question is the consumers and the marketing and getting the word out there because we're not going in any forest, taking out any wood. Um, that's, that's not what we do. Definitely. Definitely. Even here in Ontario, like every tree, no matter where it is, it has to be marked by a registered forester, uh, and cut down. Even all of our forests are fully managed. So, uh, even that, even, and, and even in a normal forest, like it's healthy to do what they're doing. Um, so even where I am, it's virtually all, all, all cut down, you know, marked and all done properly. Uh, Paul, what happened to Slap Saturday this weekend? I didn't have any sharp blades, folks. I didn't have any sharp blades. So, so Paul dropped the ball. No sharp blades. I, I ran out of oil for my CBM sharpener. Um, so, to, yeah, I dropped the ball, folks. I apologize. Everything. I've been getting a few, uh, a few DMs. <laughs> it's... Uh, so, it, so Matt, it's almost nice we're... not to do a video to, to see all the people that miss it. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't the idea, right? <laughs> no, that was not the idea at all. Not the idea at all. Um, um, Matt, yeah. I know you to go in two minutes. Yeah. So we, we thank you for, for checking in. Thanks for having me. Uh, appreciate it. Um, do you want it? No, it's too short for a tour. we we'll leave that to Paul. Perfect. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> Mac can uh, show us those dovetails on that case behind them. They're pretty badass. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> We're kind of hidden now. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you very much, uh, Matt. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, bro. I'll see you Goodbye. guys later. Bye. See you, Matt. Bye, Bye. Matt. Um, so, Paul, you want to do a tour? Sure. Sure. I can turn the camera around here. All right. All right. Here we go. Let me, uh, well, first off, we actually do have a big walnut on the, on the sawmill. Fairly large for us. That's for sure. It's about, uh, 50 inches wide or so. Wow. And this is, uh, our sawmill. It's not, it's not a wood miser WM 1000, but, uh, it gets the job done. How, how big is it? Uh, we can cut 72 inches wide, um, and it uh, has a 20 horsepower. It's all electric. One of the best things I've ever done is go all electric, and uh, it does a really job. It's very similar to the Woodmiser WM1000, um, not as beefy probably. And then I do have uh, Far West. You talk about starting your business in 83. I was born in 83, <laughs> and uh, you talk about a Woodmiser in the 90s. Well, I got a Woodmiser from the 90s also. This is my... Uh, yeah, 1992 LT40 HD, and uh, I bought it oh, used electric. about eight eight years ago. I bought this from from a company that they told me they cut a million board feet with it before I even got it. Wow! Uh, it's got uh, thirteen thousand hours on it, 
So I, I guess that's a lot. I don't know. And it's, it's a good amount. It's a good amount, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's funny, even when I started doing the urban, the logs and, and the slabs and stuff, like wide slabs were still kind of a new thing. Like sawmills didn't, as you know, the Woodmiser WM1000 didn't exist 10 years ago or whatever. So I had actually cut this sawmill uh, right here and I can pop mm -hmm. out these two bolts and I can slide this oh, and I can, yeah. cut, I can cut up to 42 inches on this mill. And it yeah. uh, works really well. And with me, everything's here at one location. So I'm very efficient. I got my two sawmills here. Uh, we have our bandsaw blade sharpener right in here which is lacking oil, unfortunately. So uh, mm -hmm. I need to get on with that. And I used to have the old drag sharpener, but we have the CBN one now, which this is a dream to use in comparison. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we can head down. Uh, to the Good thing you've here. got your own sharpener with the steel shortages and everything. We are so backed up on blades. Oh, really? Even just like getting blades? Oh yeah, yeah. We're 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 telling people you better plan out three to four months for your blades. Yeah, I, I call wood mines and it, that's what they told me. Mm hmm. Yep. It, what, whatever your usage is going to be, and we, you know, it and it's wood is making more more bands than they've ever ever made, um, and make, making max production. And if we added more equipment to make more, we couldn't get the steel. So. Wow. Yeah, I, I called looking for blades, and she goes, it's going to take four months. Do you still want it? I said, yeah, because in four months, I'm not going to have it. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> right? <laughs> so we try to, uh, we use all of our waste also. So I have an outdoor wood boiler. This one here actually heats the shop during the winter, so it's actually off right now. But this one's puffing away on the warm day because this one here heats our one of our conventional kilns. Oh, nice. And uh, I need to get rid of this stuff here anyways. As you know, Robert, you generate a lot of offcuts. Well, both of us, obviously. How about you, Far, far West, what, what happens with your waste? Uh, so, some of it, uh, the clean stuff that we keep separated goes to a facility near us that gets uh, uh, chipped into animal bedding. Okay. And nice. um, so, so that's that's one option. Some of it... Uh, some of it's just not clean enough and, and ends up having to go to the landfill. We are working. We really, really want to get um, something along the biochar or, or something along those lines. California has a lot of restrictions on, on uh, you know, the smoke emissions and, and what you could do. So I'm not sure we could do what you're doing, but um, right, we're, right, we're looking right. at some options. Yeah. All right. I'll take you through the shop a little bit. My guy, I, I am a working business, so we are got a little bit of noise here. Well, yeah, this is our, <laughs> we got a really, yeah, exactly, uh, five-quarter Canadian black walnut, just like this, is a super, super common product, so this has been sawmilled by us, dried, and now, basically, we get into the shop, this is my main guy, Troy, hey, Troy, what's up, Paul? Hi, Troy. <laughs> I was one of the first businesses, uh, or woodworkers, or whatever we are, to get a giant CNC to surface slabs. And uh, this has been a fantastic choice. So we use this to surface the really big ones. And then this is our, this is our, I love this machine. We got a 37 inch wide joint or planer. So rough lumber goes in and then the nice clean lumber comes out. Very nice. And then, uh, yeah, rest of the shop. What are you doing? All right, stay organized. So we're working on, uh, you know, constantly tabletops. This is uh, um, something that we have manufactured for us, and this has actually become a very, very big seller for all of my dealers, Steel C Channel. And we put that in all the tables. It kind of just goes in into these grooves like so, and then we can bolt that right down. And then, uh, yeah, just uh, that's the shop pretty loud in here, I suppose. Can you guys hear okay? Oh, yep. that's my father-in-law. I'll get out of here. What's up? And then we just got this machine too. This is a 52-inch wide uh, planer, sander, all that good stuff. Woo! Sorry about that. A little loud in there. <laughs> Let me get out of there. There we go. Woo! So, uh, yeah, and then basically we have uh, down here, we have a conventional kiln, which is just a standard heat to vent. So we have the wood boiler that runs hot water to it, and we have a radiator 
you know, the heat goes in, comes out the back, takes out the moisture. And then we have a vacuum kiln just on the other side. And uh, this is what I'm developing here. It looks like a 20 foot shipping container, but basically I'm making a very similar kiln to the Vacutherm I dry, but it's going to be designed around a DIY kit that Robert, you could supply your own 20 foot shipping container. From me, you're going to buy a box that you literally bolt onto the back and you're going to weld on some bracing and you're going to have yourself a vacuum kiln. Well, hopefully, <laughs> I'm hoping to, I'm, I'll be drawing a vacuum next, next week is what I'll be doing. And I'm hoping to be able to, to possibly start providing the kit within about two to three months. Okay, let, let me ask you, we, we'll talk about this. I'm willing to invest in it and send you some money now. That's exactly what everyone's been saying. That's amazing, man. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, it'll, it'll be able to be able to heat it with like a wood boiler. If you have scraps, you could use a propane boiler. So it'll be very inexpensive to use. Um, and honestly, really inexpensive to start up as, as you know, as uh, if you just have a, it won't be $100,000. You know what I'm saying? Which uh, even for me, uh, you know, I'm a relatively small business it is a lot of money. That. That was my, my biggest investment I've ever done is my vacuum kiln now that we imported from China. And that was around 100000 And uh, I definitely understand that when you take on that debt, you, you know, you got to really, really hustle, which is fine, which is good. But that little bit of debt stress is, is a little, you know, a little, a little heavy on you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And, okay. Wood by Wix says, does it have structural integrity to pull a vacuum? Yeah, so I'm actually going to be, I've designed an exoskeleton that will go on the outside of the shipping container. And uh, we, we received, uh, we have a CNC plasma cutter from Avid CNC that will be uh, cutting all the ribs and then welding and adding it to the outside. So you'll still have a full, you'll have six foot width that you'll be able to put in there, your sticker pack, and uh, about 18, 19 foot long. So yeah, very important. We don't want to crush it into a little, little tin can. Um, and we're also kind of like, you know, it's not going to be full stainless steel on the inside. It's going to have a coating that you can purchase relatively simple, you know, cheaply and, and apply yourself. And yeah, maybe, maybe the container is not going to last a lifetime, but the shipping container might last five years or 10 years and you can replace the container. But again, you're replacing a, a $4,000 container instead of, you know, uh, purchasing a $100,000 machine to start. So that, that, that's the plan. What's the price point on the kit? Have you figured that out yet? Yeah, I, sh I, I should be around 20000 Canadian. Okay. And then you'd have to get your own shipping container, and then I'll have the content uh, that basically, free content, you know, just on YouTube or whatever, on installing the bracing, the coating, and, uh, and basically installing my, my box. And it'll be, it, it'll be the simplest thing. It'll be, it'll be get electricity to it and basically get water to it. And that's all you need to do. You hit the start button and you, and then that's it. Uh, very simple. I fortunate five years of running my vacuum. You, you really learn a lot, especially with a vacuum kiln because you have a cycle that's only seven to 14 days. So, uh, and fortunately mine was Chinese. So a lot of things broke on it. So I had to fix it. <laughs> and, uh, so that's been an, an, an education for me on, in learning how, how the whole thing works. And, uh, I think uh, I think it's going to be really sweet. And it, it's very, it'll be very similar to the eye dry that that vacuum therm works that builds yeah. right. Makes, I yeah. represent eye dry, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. But but I'm going to oh, that that's interesting too. So. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So we got a question from Steel Grain uh, for us. Can you compost it and sell it? I guess we're talking about your cutoffs. Um. I I. I don't know that it would be a lucrative enough market out here because there are others like, like we take it to compost facilities the hog fuel facilities you know and and then we take it to the animal bedding so we've got three different avenues but us to do that on our own it's it's not something that we've gotten into but but i know that some of the larger uh arborists in the area like west coast arborists i know they're looking at some something for because they have a lot you know that they're they have 300 municipalities in california and uh, th that they that they handle and so what to do with the rest of the tree is a really a, a really pressing issue that that uh entrepreneurs and and uh, state agencies and federal agencies are ready to tackle that they, they know it it's it's the next thing we need to do 
What about you? What do you do with your waste? The, the sawdust, I turn into compost for my farm. Mm -hmm. um, the wood, burn it to keep warm in the winter. <laughs> it doesn't get that cold here. We, we, we have yeah, more exactly. wood than we burn. <laughs> I mean, and we, we do. My parents, they, their exclusive heat in their home is, is wood. That's how I grew up. Um, but but still doesn't get that cold here. Uh, but we do sell some, some of our sawdust, and that, that market kind of comes and goes, but some of our sawdust it goes into mushroom farmers. And then, uh, yeah, but, but we have to separate it because certain mushrooms do better with hardwoods, certain mushrooms do better with softwoods. So, so when we separate it, we do have a market for that, but it's, it's not a big enough market. So we, we need to definitely increase that. We, we are testing it out with some orchards. We have some orchards that, that like to put it under their trees. Um, and, and so they're, they're playing around with that, but, but we definitely need to find larger solutions. Well, let me, let me tell you, I screwed up and threw it in my form in, in the garden, the soil. Not good? No, 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 not good at all. Com what happened? It completely threw off uh, the, the soil. The pH or uh, something probably, eh? Yeah. Was it too hot? Too yeah. hot? Yeah. yeah. Too much carbon. Yeah. It, it, it had a hundred times carbon than it needed. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, okay, we have a, what is the lead time on a WM1000 and cost of milling tracks? Um, so I had mentioned before that on a hydraulic mill, we're out a year and a half. The only mill that you could get in any decent lead time right now that I'm aware of is a WM1000. We've got some of those uh, going to become available end of September. And I, boy, it, you're going to be close to 60000 for the mill, uh, 4000-ish uh, for, uh, for the tracks, and then you do pay for freight. Once it arrives to you, Woodmaster comes out, installs it, trains you on it at no additional charge. That's a good price. That, cause that mill, it really good, is. That is a good price. Really that's, a, that's a smoking mill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it really is. We begged for that mill for years. We kept going, come on, you have to build us this. I can sell them. I can sell them. I can sell them. <laughs> so we had the prototype, actually, and we tested that, and, you know, you know, found all the kinks and everything, the – the engineers out there, you know, installing it, you know, piece by piece out in our yard. And now they're just, they're just plug and play. They're, they're so much easier now. So. I think yours, yours is even orange, isn't it? Uh, no, mine, mine's not orange. The new ones are orange. Ours oh, is gray. Are, and and oh, we don't, okay. yeah, we don't have the prototype anymore. We have, uh, we, we bought a different one. We have the prototype just to test it. Just, you know, we had that for about six months. And then my dad cried the day that it, the, the day that I sold it. So, um, so we, we, we had to buy him a new one. So. <laughs> nice, nice. I got a but, question for you guys. Maybe maybe you've looked into this. Uh, I've always wanted to kind of add into my business, like somebody buys some furniture or lumber that like a tree gets planted or like to, to join some sort of organization like that. Is, is, are you guys aware of like a good one or, or what's out there for that type of thing? You know, we're working on – oh, I'm sorry, Robert. Did you have an answer first? I do not. Okay. Um, what, one of the things that we're working on uh, doing in with, with the new store, and I don't think it's going to be a piece of lumber. Maybe it's a, a certain quantity or certain board footage every time we hit certain uh, certain milestones, perhaps, sure. um, that, we, that we do a planting. So we're, we're considering... Uh, some sort of a partnership with the California Urban Forest Council or Arbor Day Foundation, both of whom are Urban Wood Network members. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're thinking of, okay, uh, it would be easier for us to donate to do that versus us doing a team to go out and plant. Because right now, right. Yeah, with the grants that we have, uh, like, you know, it, each time you apply for a grant, to do urban wood recycling or urban wood processing in California, you have to go, okay, a percentage of that has to be uh, for tree canopy increase. And so we'll plant 200 trees. If you get X amount of money, you plant 60 trees. And so there's, um, so there, there's different, different things that we do there that we're already kind of doing, but that's a lot of work to go plant those trees. Really rewarding, really fun. 
but organizing that is a lot of work. And so we're thinking of partnering with someone like, uh, so, so Arbor Day Foundation might be, a, might be a good one. And if you guys ever go to the partners conference, uh, Arbor Day puts on a partners conference every, once a year. This year it's going to be in Louisville, Kentucky. And so we'll be there uh, talking about the Urban Wood Network if, y'all, if you guys are able to come. What's this again? Uh, Arbor Day Foundation uh, does a partners and community forestry event every year. And the last several years, uh, so last year it was virtual. Uh, the year before that, we did it in Cleveland. And that, that's when Taylor Guitars introduced the first Urban Wood uh, guitar. Uh, and then the year before that, it was in Irvine, California. And, and so this year it's going to be in Kentucky. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and um, on Friday, it will be all about Urban Wood, kind of a gathering, uh, uh, networking, and uh, who's doing what, very similar to what you're doing here, but, you know, a lot, you know, in, in person, so there'll, there'll be a lot of uh, interaction. Okay. All right, so if anyone has any questions, um, oh, may I... What about finding a way to add it to a 3D printing and making wood filaments? I think that would be for Paul for the kiln. Sorry, what was that? It says, what about finding a way to add it to 3D printing and making wood filaments? I'm thinking that maybe for the kiln. 3D printing. Um... I don't know. I, I've always uh, I've always wanted to add 3D printing to my furniture business. Because uh, it'd be really cool, I you know, table bases and stuff like that to be able to ship a little 3D printed table base to a customer or something like that. Uh, but the plan is really to use uh, flat plate steel with the, with the CNC plasma cutter that I have and, uh, and, and do all the bracing like that. Okay, cool. So, so we've been on for an hour. I, I think that's great. Um, I know we all need to get back to work. Yeah. Um, and I, I thank you all for your time and, and greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thanks for having us. Nice to see you again, Robert. Nice to, nice to put a face there, Paul. <laughs> yeah, happy to, happy to be here. And I'm going to yeah. join the, 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 the Urban Wood Network. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.